Good afternoon. I am Deborah Porter. I am mom coach with the with Washington Parent, and I'm also uh, in charge of the Balanced Life Parent Advice column there at Washington Parent. And we're excited to have you join us today. Washington Parent has been a trusted resource for parents in the DMV for decades now. And today we are super excited to bring to you two incredible physicians from the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group who serve Kaiser Permanente patients in DC, Maryland, and Virginia, pediatricians, Dr. Christina Brown and Dr. Ed Segura. So excited to have you join us today. Thank you so much. Dr. Brown, would you please introduce yourself and then Dr. Segura, if you would follow suit. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Deborah, for having us. My name is Dr. Christina Brown. I'm a pediatrician at the Kaiser Permanente White Marsh Medical Center, just north of Baltimore. Um, and I have two kids, and I'm excited to talk to you about vaccines today. Good afternoon. It's really an honor to be with you today. I'm Ed Segura. I'm a pediatrician at Kaiser Permanente's Ashburn location, which is in Loudoun County, Virginia. Thank you both for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us. We're very excited to talk to you today about the importance of pediatric vaccinations. August is National Immunization Awareness Month, and it's a great time to ensure that your child is up to date on all necessary vaccinations. Vaccines are essential in protecting children from serious illness, and over the years, vaccines have saved literally millions of lives. So we know that pediatric immunization rates have decreased since the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic. The CDC reports that only 78% of kindergartners in the Washington DC area had the necessary vaccinations to start the school year last year. That's the lowest percentage in any part of the country among the 47 states reporting vaccination data. So that's why we're working with an expert panel today of pediatricians to answer your questions about pediatric vaccines. If you're watching live, please post any questions that you have in the comments and we will do our best to answer them live while we're here today. Dr. Brown, I think I'd like to start with you. I think most watching know what a vaccine is, but if you'd like to touch on that, that'd be fine. But the real question I wanna ask right now is why now? It seems like vaccines are more important or at least being discussed maybe now more than in previous years. Why would you say that is? Sure. And Deborah, hearing those statistics, it's remarkable. My daughter is going off into the world and starting kindergarten this year. So, you know, to, to think of, um, you know, her friends there, we want to make sure that every child has received the vaccines that they're eligible for. So it helps protect themselves, but also the community, um, the other children around them, as well as the families at home. So why now? So many, many people did not seek medical care during the pandemic, tried to hunker down and stay home as much as possible. While we are seeing many children come back into the office, there are still some you know, that have not entered into the medical facilities for fear, um, but there's also just been some mistrust as well in the community. It's hard to know who to trust anymore. We are hearing advice from, you know, our own parents and the grandparents and social media and the news, and it's hard to know what to trust anymore. That's why I'm so glad, you know, that we're doing this today because as pediatricians, we are here to, you know, care for your children, to be a trusted resource for you. So, you know, for any families that have questions about vaccines, this is what we do day in and day out, and that's what we're here for. So Thank you asked you. what is a vaccine. Um, vaccines are a safe and effective way to work with your body's own natural immune system. So, you know, each vaccine works a little bit differently. Some help protect against viruses, some bacteria, but, you know, 
for all of these germs, um, it can introduce either a part of the of this germ or a killed version of this germ and tell your body and your body says, what is that? It recognizes it as foreign and it builds something called an antibody. Antibodies are proteins that are part of your immune system that then if your body is ever exposed to that virus again in the future, it can say, oh no, they, you know, kind of build, build a little army of these proteins to help protect you um, from getting any symptoms from this illness, help fight it off, help reduce your risk of, of dying from some of these illnesses. That's perfect. Thank you so much for explaining that. Dr. Segura, if you'd like to tap in and, and, and add anything to that, that would be great. But I would also love for you to step into the question, how vaccines actually work once they enter the body. Sure. So, um, our human body is very good at developing a defense system once it has been exposed uh, to a germ. And so the idea is, uh, let's not wait until someone has to be exposed uh, to a germ that is potentially deadly, to, to be honest. I mean, sometimes we are talking about life and death. Um, and so uh, these vaccines are manufactured uh, in a way that it can introduce something similar to that original germ into our bodies. And our bodies uh, do everything that Dr. Brown was just talking about. They create a strong uh, reaction and uh, there's all kinds of memory built into our immune system. And, um, and so then if someone is uh, unfortunate and gets exposed to one of these germs, uh, the body turns on the immune system right away uh, as, if it, uh, as if it recognizes, um, just like we recognize uh, someone's face or we recognize someone's voice, uh, the body recognizes this germ and uh, starts to defend us from it uh, right away. That's fantastic. I love that you're able to kind of explain that to, to those of us that aren't in the medical field in layman's terms. So thank you. I'd like to ask why vaccines are given so early. Dr. Segura, maybe you can begin this time. Why, why do we begin a series of vaccines so early? So there's a few things that people need to know, uh, which is uh, certainly when uh, the baby is inside mom, uh, mom transfers some protection uh, against germs uh, to the baby. So uh, when baby is uh, born, uh, he or she is not completely uh, defenseless. Uh, they have the benefit of some of the antibodies that were transferred uh, from mom. But the next thing that's important uh, to mention is that some of these uh, germs uh, that are part of the uh, vaccines that we give, for example, at two months and four months and six months of age, really when you look at what these germs do, uh, most of the damage that they do to people is very early on in life. Um, so if I can give you a quick example, uh, whooping cough. Uh, there's many adults who get whooping cough and maybe it's a terrible inconvenience um, and it might make you uh, feel under the weather uh, for a long time, maybe several weeks or a month. Um, so that would be an adult with whooping cough. But now what if we talk about a baby? Uh, under one year old with whooping cough. Then we're talking again about something that's potentially life-threatening. Uh, a baby uh, who gets whooping cough uh, might need to go to the hospital, uh, might need to go uh, to the intensive care unit. And so I'm saying all of that to get to the point that the timing of vaccines has to do with when a baby's immunity goes down from the, the gift that they received from mom, that goes down. And then we have to introduce a vaccine to start protecting that baby against some of these, ger some of these germs that really could be quite threatening, uh, even though the baby is only two months old, four months old, six months old, et cetera. So there is, there is a science and a reason behind that. Dr. Brown, let me ask you this. Is it okay then to kind of pick and choose vaccines? From what Dr. Segura was just explaining, I don't know that many, you know, whooping cough is not something that we hear a whole lot about. I think we, 
sort of more common things, chicken pox, flu, or things like that. But is it okay? Can I decide, well, I want my baby to have this one and not that one? What are your thoughts on that? So I definitely recommend to follow the schedule that's given by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So I used to work as a hospitalist. So I used to work at a large children's hospital. I saw several cases of that whooping cough. And it is heartbreaking, honestly, to see children with illnesses that you know could have been prevented with a vaccine. So it's heartbreaking. Um, so you mentioned chicken pox. So, you know, many of us have had chicken pox. And so I do have families say, oh, I had chicken pox. You know, as a child, it was no big deal. We had chicken pox parties, all of that. But, you know, if you think about it, so for many, many children, um, chicken pox was just a mild illness. It was, um, you know, blisters on the skin, fever, not wanting to eat or drink as much, and symptoms maybe last a week. But during that time, the parents were out of work, children missing school. It was inconvenient and all that builds up. But for some children, it was much more serious. So you could get skin infections from the blisters, you could get pneumonia, you could get even something called encephalitis swelling in the brain. So it it was life threatening. Um, some children, about 100 children per year died, many were hospitalized. It was serious for some. So some asked, you know, why do I need this? Because you just don't know if your child will have mild symptoms from it or if they will be one of the severe cases. So it's just not worth taking the chance when you can prevent these illnesses. And, well, Dr. Brown, let oh, me ask you this too, just quickly to, to kind of give you a follow-up question to that. Okay, so we've got now what we know can, can help us in the vaccines. What about the side effects of the vaccines, right? Can, are the side effects, side effects generally mild as compared to the actual illness? Sure. The side effects are most commonly just some redness or soreness in the arm or thigh where the injection is given. Um, with many of the vaccines, children can develop fever for a day or so or might be fussy or fatigued for a day or so. Older children may complain of some muscle aches, but the side effects are very mild, you, you know, just a minor inconvenience for a day or so compared to risk of hospitalization and even death from some of these illnesses if they were not protected. Dr. Segura? You know, I wanted uh, to go back to something that you mentioned, Deborah, which is we really are very fortunate that we live in a time and in a place where um, where many parents, so many parents, are really unaware of what's in the vaccines um, because they don't have any personal experience with it. And I just kind of want to make the point um, that it's not random that we don't see uh, these diseases very frequently. Um, it's not luck. Um, it really is uh, the investment uh, that society, that communities have made uh, into vaccines. Um, if I can give you one more example of a vaccine that's given at uh, ages two months, four months, and six months, it's against a germ called Haemophilus influenza type B. And so we, we sometimes call it HIB uh, for short. And HIB was a leading cause of meningitis in babies. Um, and this HIB vaccine came out in the 1980s, so not, not that long ago. The amazing thing is that when you talk uh, to people who became uh, pediatricians in the 1990s, 2000s, 2010s, they have not seen a single case of Hib causing meningitis. So what do we know? We know that the vaccine was incredibly successful at uh, preventing Hib meningitis. But what do we also know is that that germ has not disappeared from our environment. Uh, that germ is still there. Um, and that germ uh, could go ahead and cause all kinds of devastating illness in a baby uh, if that baby was not immunized. And so, uh, so that's, just a, that's just one example of maybe uh, when a pediatrician is going through the names of these vaccines, 
uh, the family might say, uh, I'm not even familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it's, I think that's, that's great news. That really <laughs> means that we've been successful, but it doesn't mean that it's time to take a break from that vaccine. Thank yes. you so much for sharing that. Let me ask this question because this has come up over and over again and it'll subside and then it kind of comes up again. Is autism in any way connected to or related to vaccines? Dr. Segura, you can, can tackle that first and then Dr. Brown, if you have any follow-up comments. Sure. So quite a few years ago, um, a article was published in a scientific journal that proposed that there was a link between autism and the MMR vaccine. And of course, I, I, it's kind of one of those situations. I remember where I was when I first heard about that article. That's, that's how important it was uh, to people in the medical field. I truly remember right where I was when I heard that. Um, and then what is absolutely amazing is that that information and those conclusions uh, that were in that article were then debunked. And of course, they weren't debunked. It wasn't debunked overnight. Um, there was a process, um, a scientific process, and and a um, a process within that medical journal that found out uh, that the the article and its conclusions were not really uh, true and representative of of what happens. But it's kind of one of those situations where you've let the cat out of the bag. Um, the the word got out there and so uh all the efforts that that particular medical journal made to retract the article all the efforts that we the pediatricians uh made to reassure uh, parents and families uh that this was uh, misinformation and not reliable information um it was so hard because that uh, statement that there was a link was already out there now what happened since this because it was proposed, and even though it was eventually completely um, uh, debunked, um, many studies of tens of thousands of children um, were conducted to see, is there a link going forward? If we continue to use this vaccine, um, is there a link uh, with autism? Not just with this vaccine, but with any vaccines. And uh, the answer, thank goodness, was that no, there truly was not a link um, in any uh, way that you could say. Ian, you you saw same numbers of children with autism who were vaccinated and unvaccinated, and uh, no specific link. But I will tell you, even though that misinformation was decades ago, um, it still is on the parents' mind. Uh, many parents who agree with vaccines will still share with me that it's in the back of their mind. So it's just very unfortunate that that happened. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we, we do get this question frequently and there is no link. Yeah, you know, how can I say more clearly? There is no link between the MMR vaccine and autism. There has been so much so much research into this topic. They've also looked at some of the additives to vaccines, so like thimerosal, for example, um, and we, that's been taken out of most vaccines, and yet we're seeing cases of autism rise. So you know, there there is no link between thimerosal and autism as well. There have been there's been so many studies looking at this in many different countries to make sure that what we are recommending is is true. So um, there's no link with autism. Many families also ask about autoimmune illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, there's no link between the vaccines and increased risk of autoimmune illnesses as well. I know that's on many parents' minds. And with the MMR vaccine and autism, that's given at, the MMR vaccine is given at 12 months of age. Parents and pediatricians can often see signs of autism before a child turns 12 months old. So, you know, it, it was there to begin with. We know that there is a genetic component to autism. We don't know all of the causes right now for autism. There's a lot of research being done there as well. And um, but I want to encourage families that it is safe to give the MMR vaccine. Thank you both so much for clearing that up. That is a question that just continues to kind of 
hover and, and kind of resurfaces again and again, which is why it's so important that your the medical advice you're getting are from the experts and not just from something you're reading online or seeing on social media. So I'd like to move now into the drop that we've seen in the number of children getting vaccinated. And I'd like to ask a two-part question. One, why do you think we're seeing a drop in vaccination rates? And two, how do you think that may impact um, these common diseases and children in the population? Um, Dr. Brown, we'll continue with you on those questions. Sure. So I think some families are still nervous to come into a medical facility. They're worried about catching coronavirus and prefer to stay at home for now. Some families homeschooled during the pandemic and they continued to do so, you know, even now as we are two years into the pandemic. So um, some families are choosing to stay home and they may think, oh, my child is not around others that, you know, they may not be at risk for these illnesses, but that's not true. So most people don't spend 100% of their time at home. That would be very hard to do. Um, there are vaccines for things like tetanus. So tetanus um, comes from um, tetanoid toxin, which you can get from a car accident. You could get from contaminated soil. You can get it from a rusty nail is the classic example. But, you know, that is not something you would catch from another child, but it can be quickly life-threatening as well if, if not caught. So it's still important to get your vaccines, even if you feel like you are not at higher risk of catching it from other children in the community. Some families are still coming into the office and are choosing not to get some of the vaccines vaccines for some of these reasons we talk about and we just do our best as pediatricians to try and figure out you know what are your concerns about it what questions do you have about it and make sure that families are looking at reputable websites to get their information um, instead of you know looking at social media um, for that or their friend's friend you know had had this issue we want to make sure that we're that we're looking at scientific evidence. Yes. Dr. Segura, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's a couple of, exactly like what Dr. Brown said, um, certainly uh, it's no coincidence um, that these uh, statistics that you mentioned at the very beginning um, are uh, coming after two and a half years of pandemic. Um, you know, the pandemic really exposed uh, a lot of problems, a lot of inequities um, in our society. Mm -hmm. um, it exposed them. And then it also, some of them made a lot worse. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of inequities in terms of uh, people's uh, ability uh, to access health care. Um, uh, a lot of inequities in terms of uh, people just having uh, the resources or being able to access resources in their community. Um, and so uh, I, I think uh, understanding what the pandemic has uh, brought to light and then also the impact that it has had on some families uh, is one way of getting to the explanation of the drop in in vaccine rates. The other thing I think is worth mentioning, I, th I think we've we've all kind of uh, uh, spoken about it, is uh, the explosion of misinformation uh, spe directed specifically about healthcare, uh, about our body's immune systems, about uh, about uh, vaccines, uh, certainly with COVID-19. Uh, um, uh, again, I would want to underline that I'm talking about uh, misinformation uh, about what vaccines do or don't do. And um, I think when you are overwhelmed uh, by some of this misinformation on social media, um, it does it does otherwise uh, want make you ask questions. And so those folks who come to see us, to see uh, those of us in primary care uh, prepared with those questions, we are happy to answer and address those questions. It's unfortunately those folks who have those doubts and those questions, and then they decide to skip things like well visits or skip routine visits with a pediatrician. I, I think uh, that's a big problem. 
Dr. Segura, let me ask you this. Can you talk a little bit about natural immunity mm -hmm. versus herd immunity? Kind of what, what the difference is and what we're, what we're aiming for, what the goal is, what, what the medical community would like us to do. I, I would love to answer that again, using some examples. Um, uh, I also had chicken pox when I was a kid, and um, there might be some exceptions, but in general, most people are aware that if you got chicken pox as a kid, you're, you're set for life. Um, you won't have chicken pox ever again, and so that's one virus that you never have to worry about. But there's lots of other germs that aren't quite as simple, that aren't quite as um, uh, obvious in terms of you got it and you'll never have it again. And so a fantastic example is uh, COVID-19, where I think many of us have folks uh, know people um, in, our, in our immediate circles who have had it uh, once and then had it twice. Uh, hopefully, we don't know too many people who have had it three times. Um, but we know uh, from the news, uh, we all get the, the news that, oh, there might be a new variant or uh, there might be a new uh, mutation of a variant, and now we're at risk uh, of getting it again. So what does that mean? So those people who got it once, um, did that give them lifelong immunity against COVID-19? Well, clearly not. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have gotten it a second time. And so natural immunity, um, you can't really uh, take it to the bank. Uh, like you can with um, with some diseases. You can't say, I'm done, I'm set, uh, I can feel safe. Uh, that would be a very false uh, sense of, of safety. Uh, natural immunity, uh, again, sticking with the COVID example, may last uh, a few months. Um, and then that's it. Um, and then it may be very different from even people in your in your family. Uh, uh, my brother might have a different experience with natural immunity. My sister uh, might have a different uh, experience uh, than than I do. Um, when you're talking about vaccines, um, yes, uh, maybe vaccines don't get necessarily give you lifelong immunity, uh, which is why we're uh, talking about boosters uh, for the COVID vaccine, uh, but they do give you a more predictable type of response. Uh, again, we're talking about the immune response from our body. Um, a more predictable response in terms of saying uh, you are highly likely to have a high level of protection against these germs uh, if you get them, if you follow the vaccines, uh, the one that was just one dose, the ones that are two doses, if you follow uh, the, um, the directions about how to get these vaccines, uh, then you have a high level of immunity. Now, in any community, there will always be people who, for whatever reason, either cannot get a, a vaccine, or even if they get a vaccine, um, their body is such that they don't develop a lot of protection. And yet we can still protect those folks, those vulnerable folks, with what you mentioned, herd immunity. And so herd immunity is when a certain high percentage of the community, of the population, has gotten the vaccine, is no longer likely to get the vaccine or to transmit it to each other. And so therefore, those vulnerable people uh, in, that we uh, see at work, that we see at school, uh, that we see at church, that we see in our communities, um, those vulnerable people are much less likely to get that germ uh, because so many of the people that they interact with are already protected. I think that's, that's kind of um, the... You know, you, you mentioned what, what happens if we don't get vaccines. And I think uh, there are examples that we can see in the news. There have been outbreaks of things like measles. Um, and uh, certainly, I, I would say it is, it is possible to get the measles even if you are immunized. That would be very unfortunate. But I think your risk is much, much higher if you are not immunized and there's an outbreak of measles in your community, you get exposed to it, you're much more likely to get sick from it. And so I think that's the, um, that the risk uh, that a community <laughs> takes when it allows um, herd, herd immunity uh, to 
start to go down, start to go down, start to go down, then all kinds of vulnerable people are at risk. Thank you so much, Dr. Segura, for sharing that. And you mentioned boosters. And so Dr. Brown, I'm gonna ask you, what are the common vaccinations and the vaccines that children should be getting from birth to college age? And which one of those should we be concerned need to get boosted before our kids maybe head off to college? Sure, let's get into it. So Dr. Segura mentioned some of these before. So at birth, um, we give the hepatitis B vaccine even while infants are still in the hospital. And then at two months, four months and six months, we give vaccines that help protect against hepatitis B, polio, tetanus, whooping cough, and then the Hib, that meningitis vaccine, and the Prevnar, which is also a meningitis vaccine, helps protect against streptococcal pneumonia, but it that bacteria can also cause pneumonias and ear infections, so it helps protect against those things as well. And then you get a little break until a year um, when you get more vaccines. That's that measles, mumps, rubella, the MMR, the varicella vaccine. Um, and you start to get some boosters from some of those earlier vaccines. So the Prevnar and the Hib are given again. Um, and then around 14, 15 months, you can do a combination vaccine that has diphtheria, tetanus, uh, whooping cough in it as well. So um, then around age four or so, so before children are going into kindergarten, you can give some boosters. So um, we have a couple of the vaccines combined with the brands that we have to try to reduce the number of pokes. So thankfully, so we do the measles, mumps, rubella, and chicken pox all together, and then the tetanus, whooping cough, polio together. And you get a little break on until about nine or so. Nine is the youngest that we can give that HPV vaccine. That's human papilloma virus. HPV is a sexually transmitted infection that causes cervical cancer for women, penile cancers for men, head and neck cancers for both. So the goal is to give that vaccine before a person is sexually active so that then if they're ever exposed to that virus, that they are protected against it. So HPV is one of the huge reasons that women are getting all those pap smears in their um, early adulthood and everything to help make sure that there's no evidence of cervical cancer or changes. So um, you can do that as young as nine and you actually build a better immune response with it when you're younger. Um, so you only need two of those if you start those at that age. And then at age 11, um, we give the Tdap, so that has the tetanus, um, diphtheria, um, whooping cough again, and then a meningococcal vaccine that protects against a different kind of meningitis that school-aged children and teens get. You get the booster for that when you're 16 years old. So some, you know, may get that right before they go off to college or may, may get it just as they're starting to drive. But you know, that reminds me, so some families say, oh, you know, we live close to a hospital. We live, you know, we have the medical care of 2022. You know, we don't need some of these vaccines, but meningitis can be quickly fatal. You have to recognize it quickly and seek medical care. And even then, sometimes it's too late. You know, um, even if you're able to treat it, sometimes there's loss of limbs. Um, sometimes there's deafness, blindness. Um, so many so many issues can be caused by it if it's not fatal. So, you know, even though we have excellent medical care in this country, you know, it's mm -hmm. still important to get your vaccines. Um, did I miss any, Dr. Segura? <laughs> You, you. I think you didn't mention the rotavirus yes. vaccine, which is one uh, that is drops in the mouth uh, to prevent a form of diarrhea. Um, but no, you covered it. You covered everything oh, else. And the flu, the flu vaccine, uh, lest I forget. Yeah. So from age six months and up, um, those are eligible for the flu vaccine. And we're coming up on flu season again. So we will start offering that real soon. Um, definitely by September 1st. So um, if you're in to see your doctor, definitely ask about it. 
then. We just, we have no idea what the flu season will look like this year. It's been in a strange couple years, but anything that can keep you out of the hospital, out of the doctor's office, staying in school, in the activities you want to do, keeping parents at work or where they need to be. Um, but it's just so important to get the vaccines when you're eligible for them to help prevent these illnesses. Thank you so much for just kind of giving us a rundown and giving us that timeline of when and not, you know, where we should be to be on target for those. Dr. Segura, let me ask you something. The FDA and the CDC have both approved a COVID-19 vaccination for five and under. Many parents are wondering if it's safe. Many are not sure if they should allow their child to receive it. What are you telling your patients and the parents of your patients as it pertains to this? Great question. Um, the number one thing I'm uh, stressing is that it is safe. Uh, the dose of the vaccine is appropriate uh, for the for the child. So uh, as long as they're six months and older, uh, they qualify for the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, so number one, uh, safety. Um, uh, you know, some parents are a little bit put off by a term that they saw in the in the newspapers or in the social media uh, that was uh, emergency use. Um, these vaccines were given emergency use authorization. And if I could say, um, maybe when you first hear that term, it gives the impression uh, that maybe something whose safety is unknown is being released to the public. Uh, but that is not true. So just to be clear, that's not what happened. Um, so the vaccines are, um, the vaccines for COVID were developed quickly. That is true, certainly quickly uh, by scientists using research that was already established. And then on the very first day that the vaccine was manufactured, it wasn't available to everyone. Uh, people were tested. There were volunteers, uh, really heroes, uh, who uh, came forward and said, I, I'm willing to volunteer um, uh, to try this uh, vaccine out. And then when the safety data uh, came out uh, from these volunteers, then the vaccine was shared with the general public. So again, that would be the number one thing I would say in terms of safety. The next thing I would say is that I do recognize, I completely recognize that COVID-19 has not been, uh, let's say, devastating uh, to children, to infants and toddlers, like it has been with, uh, for example, senior citizens or people that had risk factors. Yet, however, um, uh, you can talk with, with any uh, physicians who have worked in intensive care units, pediat sorry, pediatric intensive care units, and they can tell you all sorts of heartbreaking stories of kids who were otherwise healthy, uh, who were absolutely destined to have a healthy long life, and that was uh, cut down by COVID. And so the point would be um, that we can't, uh, we, there's no good way to know um, who uh, might have a terrible course with COVID-19 and who might not. And again, if I could use uh, just a, a really quick analogy, um, I don't put on my seatbelt in my car because I suspect that I'm going to have an accident uh, on the road today. Not at all. I 100% I suspect that I will get home uh, all in one piece and that everything is going to be fine. But I still put the seatbelt on uh, every day because you just don't know. Um, and you don't want to be in a situation later where you might say, you know, I, I kind of wish I had done something relatively simple, relatively safe, that would have saved me a lot of trouble. And um, I, if, if this analogy rings true to some parents, um, sometimes that makes sense to them in terms of why we're recommending uh, the COVID-19. Uh, but other times, parents have other uh, concerns, uh, like you mentioned, safety concerns, uh, other uh, fears about um, a, a downsides, whether it might be uh, immediate side effects of the vaccine or long-term side effects. One thing I would say is that 
now that these vaccines are out, uh, it's not like we just close our eyes in terms of what happens next with the with these vaccines. Um, the scientific community, the medical community monitors very closely what happens. And so if I can use another uh, quick personal experience, uh, back in the 1990s, the original vaccine for rotavirus had to be recalled uh, because uh, across the country, there was something like under 10 babies that did not do well with the original, the original rotavirus vaccine. And the FDA jumped on that very quickly and said, this is not acceptable. Uh, that even though it was a small number of babies, it was just not felt to be acceptable. And the vaccine was taken uh, off the market. And then a few years later, replaced with one that was much, much safer. So we really do have a system in place uh, to monitor how the vaccines are affecting our children and teenagers. Thank you so much for that. I think that just hearing you explain that will put some parents at ease. But Dr. Brown, what about the parents that are still not at ease? What about the parents that are still hesitant to get vaccinations for their children? What about the children that are antsy about getting needles and the vaccine? How do you help to comfort both the parent and the child in situations like that? Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Segura, that was so much great information. And, you know, to stick with the COVID vaccine because we're living and breathing that right now. So, you know, some say, oh, well, we got COVID anyway, even though we were vaccinated. The goal of the vaccine is to help prevent the illness, but also prevent your risk of being hospitalized or of dying from the illness. So the numbers of pediatric deaths may be small, but for each family, it is life altering. So you are taking a gamble if you choose not to vaccinate. Even if the first time your child had COVID, it was mild, it doesn't mean that it might not be different the next time. Um, it is really important how parents um, talk to their children about vaccines. I never say to them, if if you don't behave, you're going to get a vaccine. That is that is not how we want to talk to our kids about vaccines. And I've heard it before. Vaccines are not a punishment. They're a privilege that we have to help keep you safe. And, you know, we have to explain vaccines in an age appropriate way to children. For my own children, we had, you know, pretend doctor kids. They could, you know, look at it. You could explain everything that was going to happen. Talk about how they might clean their arm and it might feel a little bit cold. Just explaining what there is to expect. I never say, oh, it won't hurt. It's That's not true. I want to build that trust with my child. It may hurt briefly, um, but then it will be over and we can go have a lollipop or, you know, whatever, whatever treat. So to make it easier. Um, I was thinking also of of all these, you know, infants less than six months that that aren't protected with the, the COVID vaccine since we don't have it for their age group yet. That's why it is so important for pregnant women to get vaccinated against, you know, all of the routine vaccines as well as the flu shot and the COVID vaccine to help protect them when they are at higher risk of these illnesses, but also to give some of those antibodies, those protective proteins to their infant until they can get their own vaccine. That's perfect. Thank you so much. We don't have any questions at the moment. And I think it's because you guys are answering the questions that are already in parents' minds. So Dr. Segura, where can parents take their children to get vaccines? Yes, so uh, certainly if there is a primary care uh, physician or um, a primary care office in the family's life, uh, that's uh, the first step. Um, uh, certainly uh, in folks who, uh, for some reason, uh, health in, lack of health insurance, you know, we also have, um, we're very fortunate that there are uh, health clinics, there are public health clinics, there are community health clinics, um, but all primary care offices um, are uh, the best place uh, to start having that conversation, answering all those questions uh, about vaccines. 
We're going to start wrapping up here. I've got one other question, and then I really want to give each of you the opportunity to share any final thoughts. But Dr. Brown, is there a site or a place where you would recommend where parents can go to get the proper information about pediatric vaccines? Sure. So the, the CDC website is a great place to see the vaccine schedules. They even have a little tool where you can put in some information about your child to tell you what they might be due for. Some children with certain health conditions may get additional vaccines as well. So um, that's one place to look. Um, and then I love the the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has a vaccine education center website. There's so much information there, including, you know, information on, on these additives or autism risk or, you know, looking at all of the scientific evidence to discuss each concern families may have. Um, they also have books for adults to read or for children, activity books and things to do. So um, that is a great website to look at as well, as well as immunize.org. Um, so that that would be some resources to look at as well as your your trusty pediatrician. So, you know, that just makes me think of, you know, some families or I've heard, you know, on, on social media, oh, those doctors are just trying to make money off of those vaccines. And we we get nothing from from vaccinating children in terms of money for the vaccine. So it is not about us. We are just here, you know, to help help weigh the risks and benefits and help you make the best decision um, about your child's care to help keep them safe and healthy. We're here because we care. Thank you so much. I am going to ask each of you, I'm going to start with Dr. Segura, share any final thoughts um, that you would like with the parents that are either watching live or even those that will undoubtedly come back and watch the replay. And then Dr. Brown, right, right after him, please. You know, I would take a moment just to say that vaccines really are a success story. And I would challenge anyone uh, to bring to my attention a better success story uh, than vaccines in terms of the impact it has had on uh, infant mortality, uh, childhood death, um, in terms of uh, taking someone from a vulnerable position in terms of the germs that are out there to a protected position. And so uh, that would be my way of emphasizing the positive, um, really sort of uh, helping uh, folks who don't know about it um, and, and maybe pointing out to them that if, if you're not aware of uh, how successful uh, vaccines have been, um, maybe uh, pointing out the, the story that many people are familiar with about polio, how polio used to be a scourge. And uh, now uh, it's okay if you're if you're a parent and you really don't give two thoughts about polio. That's fine because it has been such a successful vaccine story. Um, so I, I guess that's what I would like to leave everyone with, which is. Um, as primary care doctors, as pediatricians, it's our goal to continue that success story, to continue that success story uh, with this generation, with the next generation. Um, so I, I, I hope that would be meaningful to folks who are listening. Yes. Thank and you I, so much, Dr. Brown. Yeah. Yeah. I would just, you know, I acknowledge the the fears that, you know, even parents may have of needles um, that they may have carried from their childhood. I wish there was a way to give these not with a needle, but um, right now, right now, from almost all of them, there is not a way um, aside from giving it into the muscle or the, you know, into the tissue in the arm. So it's, it's important to how you talk about these vaccines with children. There are ways to make it more comfortable. So talk to your pediatrician. There are numbing agents. There's a little tool called a buzzy that can help vibrate or cool the arms so that you they don't feel the pain from it. Um, there are special comfort holds to help position the child so that they um, the vaccines can be given safely and help the child feel supported. So you know there are ways for these to be given and avoid them for the fear of needles, you know, we, we can help work through that with you. So. so we've got one question that has come in just before we wrap up. Dr. Brown, I'll stay with you on this one. And the mm -hmm. question is for parents of a soon to be five-year-old 
And because I, I said, I think you said you have a daughter that's heading to kindergarten too, correct? Yes. So for this parent of a soon to be five-year-old, should they wait to have their four and a half year old um, have the five to 11 year old COVID vaccine or the newer approved version for six months to four years old? Yeah, I would I would not wait. Um, as soon as you're eligible for the vaccine, I would get it to help protect that child, um, as well as those around them, because I would, um, you know, I can speak from personal experience, my, my three year old um, contracted COVID the week before the vaccines were made available. Um, and we had waited and waited for that. And, you know, to have skipped that illness, you know, would have been amazing. It was very hard to see him sick, even though his symptoms were considered mild they did not feel mild at the time and so I would I would not hesitate to get um, the vaccine if you're eligible now thank you that's very clear uh, Dr. Segura I can see just from your head nodding that you that you agree with that that yes. waiting is not the option that we just <laughs> want to go with whatever they're eligible for to just go ahead and get that one well, I think that this has been such a helpful conversation for parents. I'm so appreciative of both Dr. Brown and Dr. Segor for taking time out of their day, literally in the middle of their day to spend with us and really to spend with you as parents to put your minds at ease, to give you the information that you need, to allow you to have experts to speak to the possibilities of what you're pondering and thinking about, and also to be willing to do it here on this social media platform so that you're able to get the information that you need in a familiar and, and um, place that you're visiting often. So I think that what we just wanna do is thank Dr. Brown, thank you, Dr. Segura. We also wanna thank Casa Permanente and, and we wanna thank Washington Parent for always being willing to bring us these type of events to bring the information to us, to help us to not have to Google search because frankly, there are some things you cannot search on Google. You need expert advice. So thank you all again. There will be some links, I believe, in the comments, some of the ones that Dr. Brown mentioned for you to be able to research and to do um, you know, a little bit more digging if you are concerned or if you want more details on where your child is on their scheduled vaccine. So happy National Immunization Month, everyone. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you to the doctors. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.